I'm a feminist, but coming here to the BFI tonight to talk about women in charge of film, I've realised what has stopped me directing a film, apart from opportunity, is taking £10 million from somebody and coming back to them saying, I've got nothing. <laughs> that is my fear. I just genuinely feel like you could take £10 million away and then just come back and go, no. <laughs> I've taken all of your money. And that would be the dream I would have every night from pre-production on that just be like, there's some video of some things. I don't know, there's someone talking, there's someone crossing a road. You can't make a movie out of it though. And that's key information that you need to know. <laughs> Bye. Like that's so much money. It's so much. I don't know what I would do. If someone said, here's all the money, go and make something. I think what I'd turn up with is like, sort of maybe like a sunflower just sort of like withering. You know, like when you speed it up and it just starts off, it grows and then it just dies. I'd be like... And then at the end, it'll just be like, Finn. I think that's... <laughs> I think that'll be the film. <laughs> and I would defend it. I, mean, like, I have watched some bullshit that you lot have spent money on. You're going to take this film. Yes, it costs £10 million. And that is that. Finn. <laughs> I want the movie to be called Finn. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. That is incredible. Um, just to change the tone, I'm a feminist, but I'm very indebted to Nick Knowles of BBC DIY SOS <laughs> fame for telling me, as we got our photo taken together, which was my best side. Oh, Oh, you say, oh, you say, oh, he was right. It's my left. <laughs> was he? He was absolutely bang on. I had no idea. We literally went, so basically I won an award. And um, it was, <laughs> thanks. I won an award for Crazy Head. It's not a big deal, whatever. What was the award, Susan? It was an RTS, West of England Award. <laughs> for so best it was the Royal Television Post. Society, yeah, just for the international audience. Yeah, the Royal Television Society is a general award. And, uh, and it was presented by Nick Knowles. If you don't know who he is, Google him. And, um... He, we were going to have our pictures taken and we were about to start and he went, whoa, 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 you're on the right side. I was like, uh, what? He went, you're on the right side, you're good side. I was like, I don't know what my good side is. And he went, look, look to me, he went, left. Wow. But he's bang on, it's better. So well, this is we can thing. go, woo, or we're like, yeah, my, yeah, my back. It, I sort of understand why he knows it though, because if you yeah. can put up your own shelves, yeah. you've got a sense of symmetry. <laughs> I'm I down for it. I can't be mad. No. You saved me. Every time you see a picture of me and I'm looking, hey, it's Nick Knowles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when I went to the Cannes Film Festival, I was standing behind these men in a queue and one of them said to the other, I mean, they brought me a Russian prostitute and she wasn't even as good looking as my wife. And I thought, what's the point? True story. And... <laughs> All I said was slightly passive-aggressively to my friend, it's sex worker, actually. <laughs> it's not prostitute. Thank you very much. What I should have said is punch in the face, but I've never met people as appalling as people at the Cannes Film Festival. Really? Oh, my God. I mean, it's another level. It's like they're parodies of film people in a film. Really? Yeah. Oh, extraordinary. I do find it a little bit curious, the way they do, like, photo calls, but you've got to be on a boat. So you've got on a boat, and then they bring you in, and then you get off the boat, and then you're just sort of... Stood. It just all feels very unnatural. But if they put me on that boat, I will be on that boat, I will get off the boat, and I'll pose. No. Oh, yeah. With my oh, left side. Yeah, the left side. <laughs> no, it was just the people... Like, one guy asked me if I would... Dick Doctor his script. That sounded rude then. Um, Dick Doctor. Dick, Dick, Dick Doctor my script. <laughs> <laughs> I think you find uh, and the I, word you're looking for is sex workers. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, your turn. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think it's my turn. Uh, I'm a feminist, but when they cast an actress to play my little sister in a TV show, I was delighted that she was cute as a button, like me. There we go. <laughs> it's very, listen, it's murky waters. When so I'm in my first TV show, and they were like, this is your mum. And I was like, phew, thank God. Because if they bring someone who I would not cast myself as, I'd be like, what the fuck are you trying to say about me? 
And that's where your vanity comes into play. I don't care how noble you are for the art. If someone's going to cast your relative, you'll be like, yeah, cute, like me. Or like whatever you think is important. I think being cute is important. <laughs> it's vital. It's vital. Dick doctor my script. <laughs> I'm a feminist. But if I could have directed one famous film from history, it would be Chariots of Fire, a movie exclusively about how posh white guys feel, albeit with exquisite cinematography. <sighs> I do love that film, though. It's about all like, the motivation to run. I just love it so much. I love everything about it. I find it's such a heartfelt, elegant film, but it's only about posh white men. I'm a feminist, but when my mum told me that she thought the reason that uh, a relationship of mine had ended was because I'd put on weight, I actually agreed. <laughs> How could that possibly end a relationship? She was right. Oh, no, 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 no. It ended the relationship because he was a dickhead. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I put on weight and he was like, amongst other things. Okay, sure. Okay, so yeah, I'm not the easiest girlfriend. <laughs> Ask my boyfriend. <laughs> is Susie's no. boyfriend in tonight? Hey. Oh, he's lovely. John, is she an easy girlfriend? Yeah. She is easy. You're such brilliant. a liar. So, so quick, so quick. Live from the BMI in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Susan McCoyma, and our very special guest, Jennifer Sheridan, talking about women in charge on film. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Susan McComer, and we're talking about women in charge on film. <laughs> How have you been today, Susie? Have oh, you had a feminist day or a guilty day? I've had a really feminist day, actually. Um, me, we'll explain this later, but Jennifer, we're cooking up something. So I've seen Jennifer already today. Um, we'll talk about that. We'll yep, talk about when that. When Jennifer hits the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I've had an extremely feminist day. It's been great. I'm, I'm thrilled. I had a declutterer in to help me declutter my bedroom so that when I go on my book tour, I know where everything is. I heard you speaking about this in the green room. I didn't know that you could get people to do that. Yeah. And I've had so many of my friends who have said to me, oh, my God, I love sorting through things. It's my favourite thing. Why didn't you get me to do it? I would have done it for free. Who the fuck are they? It's just some people I know who I'd like... Can you just send be like, them my way, yeah. genuinely? And, but I was like, I can't make you stay after a certain point. Like, I can't say, oh, sure, why don't you come and go through my clothes and every single thing under my bed? Also, I don't want them to see. I don't want yeah, anyone... No. I'm like, I really liked Chloe who came, but I don't ever want to see her again. <laughs> After she's decluttered, I'm not inviting her to a party or anything, because then she's going to look at me like, I know, we'll know between us. It'll She'll be like, like uh, I've seen your pants well, on the floor. My mum was a cleaner and she worked in like different offices and at MI5 actually is a cleaner. And um, What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, You've girl. You've got a whole Edinburgh show. Okay. My mum was a cleaner <laughs> at MI5. Yeah, she was. Yeah, she was. Stop it. Was. But when she would work in her offices, she'd get like people who worked in the offices going, oh God, you're so good at <laughs> talent spotter. You're so good at cleaning. Oh, why don't you come and clean my house? So she'd be like, okay. And every time she came back from these people, People's houses and these are like rich people all she did was say how dirty they were she was oh, like really? oh they leave their knicker there they leave their trousers there just for me to clean i'm like but mom you are you are the cleaner She's like, you clean for the cleaner you clean for the cleaner <laughs> That's yeah. why I will never bring anyone into, into my no, home to I, watch it. I sort of do think that. I do think the right thing to do is tidy up. So the cleaner's not picking yeah. your pants up off the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't always do the right thing, but I do think that is the right thing to do. <laughs> but the declutterer is there to organise, sort, create new systems for you so that it doesn't get into a bad state again. Yeah. But I've already said to her, this is look, what happened was we knocked into the upstairs. This isn't strictly about films or feminism, but... We, we, knocked, we knocked through to upstairs and then we had a bigger bedroom but with no storage at all and it's all gone a bit out of hand. So I ended up, you know, putting things in boxes under beds. It's that sort of thing that I now need a system because I'm going on tour with this book tour. Guilty and feminist some, book, whatever. Guilty feminist book, whatever. Ooh. So I want to be able to go... I'll take this and this and not go, where is that? Under a bed, in a pile. What is this? Do you know what I mean? It just got out of control. <laughs> but what I did decide then today, because you know when you find old clothes in boxes and then you start to try them on and like a lot of them I just went, look, this is perfectly nice, but it's a previous era. Yeah. It's just... It's, it's another time. It's from another time when I was less good. 
Um, <laughs> it reminds me of a lack of empowerment. I have no <laughs> desire to revisit with these red culottes. <laughs> now, so, uh, yep, they, they are nice. They are nice. They might even have a nice designer label inside them. I don't care. I don't want to go back there. You can't make me. Fair enough. But I pulled out jeans and I just never wear jeans. None of you have ever seen me in jeans. Do you know why I never wear jeans? But I pulled out this pair and thought, I've been looking. They may or may not fit. We don't know. Because my weight goes up and down. I, you know, I, just, I, I just don't, I don't know if they're going to fit or not. So I put them on, you know, sort of slightly like, ooh, like a, lo, almost like I was buying a lottery ticket. I slipped them on. <laughs> up the hips, oh, they do fit. They do fit. But then I said to my declutterer, I can't really wear jeans, can I? And she went, no, they look great. What are you talking about? And so I thought, right, my declutterer can't have more faith in my hips than I have because that's not feminist. And <laughs> it is the most middle class thing anyone's ever said. It is. Uh, I was yeah. pondering that. My declutterer can't have more faith in my hips <laughs> than I have. I was actually, I looked at you a little yeah. bit like, eh. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> so I thought I'm going to walk out of the house with the same faith my declutterer has in my hips than I do. And so I just put a long jacket over it. Now, um, <laughs> but what do you think? What do you think? Do you think I can... I yes. Jeans. jeans. Yeah. Jeans. I've got to be honest. I feel quite cool in them. I feel quite... Because I just don't do jeans. I think I'm the kind you of human great. who cannot do jeans. And you've got nice ankles as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We can all go home now. I feel like we've, uh, we've picked... That's it. Thank you very much. I'm a feminist, but that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> um, so today we're talking about women in charge on film, and we can take that any way we like. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a little inkling to direct or have you directed? And I've genuinely asked Susie this question off stage because I wanted to hear on stage. Well, funny that you should say that, Debs, because I'm actually going on a director's course. <gasps> Are yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Rain Dance have uh, loads of different director's courses. I'm going on a, I've been on set since about 17 years old, but I'm going to like an ABC directing director. course. This is eyelines. This is how it works, sort of thing i'm really excited i just wanted to it's not that i necessarily want to direct but i just i need to know what's going on i don't like being on set and not fully understanding what is completely going but yeah i want to direct i guess so yes god i would never get a job would i oh i guess so i have to walk in there kick down the door and be like give me a fucking job i think susie you'd be an amazing director i think you, i'd be good you've got a lot of experience i do you've got great heart you've got great viewpoints You've got very... Ask me blushing, ladies and gentlemen, and however you wish to identify. Um. <laughs> I think you'd be great. I think, think you'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to hear what happens. Are you ready to do some stuff at the mic? <laughs> sure. Then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Susan Wakama! <laughs> Women in charge, women in charge, charge, women in charge. It's like a slogan, like girl power, like Cleopatra coming at ya, just like really seminal. That was mine, like turning on CITV and I saw these three living their life black girls with braids in Manchester with their single mom, just like, hey, hey, I can't sing the song, but Cleopatra coming at ya. I was like, shit, that's a slogan. Um, <laughs> it's like, seriously, I've got my life from those girls. But you know, it, it's buzzy. It's in. It's in, isn't it? It's in, isn't it? It's like, you know, walk into a million dollar corporation, just kick down the door and be like, oh, women in charge, take it. It's all yours. I was thinking <laughs> last night about women being in charge. And I thought, okay, before I continue, let me just be very clear. I think it's great that women are in charge in some sectors and they should be in charge more. It goes without saying, goes without saying. However, there are times when you look at a job that needs to be done and you just think, mm, do I want to do that? Do I think a sister should do that? Do I think I should waste my time? Do you think I should encourage a woman to put herself through that? Case in point, Brexit. <laughs> so now I hate it when you watch a stand-up comedy set and people are like yeah so Brexit <laughs> fucking Brexit <laughs> Brexit what's that all about oh my god isn't it so funny oh my god Brexit isn't it all everyone who vote for Brexit is stupid <laughs> so stupid I don't find it funny because the joke's on us we have to fucking go through it it's still happening so it's like to be oh it's funny no it isn't funny we're all gonna die <laughs> upside the housing market will crash and we'll all be able to afford a house that's my that's my plan um, but, uh, but the joke is on us. So, okay, I don't want to call it Brexit. Let's call it 
Let's call it the bad decision that happened that one time in 2016. Let's call it that. The bad decision that happened that one time in 2016. So that alleged pig fucker made it happen because he was like, oh, vote for me and then we'll put in this referendum. And then everyone was like, yeah, actually, you know, we quite like that referendum. And he was like, oh, fuck, bye. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm going to do that shit. Bye. And then that week, that it was like a week where everyone was like, oh, who's going to, oh, he's going to, oh, he's going to see some Brexit, ooh. And then even though Nigel Farage was like, bah, into it. He's like, I declare this Independence Day. He doesn't even talk like that. He's in a fucking cockney. He went to Dulwich College. Oh, we're going to declare this Independence Day. Goodbye, fucking wanker. Anyway, so he left. And there was like a week where you're like, oh, who's going to take, oh, no, no. And then Theresa May just came through the back and went, I'll do it. And I was like, bitch, no. I don't like you, you don't like me, but don't do it! Because at the moment everyone's looking at it going, oh God, oh no, what do we do? Oh, this woman doesn't know, this woman doesn't know. Oh, is it a hard break to get soft This woman doesn't know, this woman doesn't know. And it really annoys me. I'm like, bitch, you should have just stood to the side and been like, I ain't cleaning this up. I'm not cleaning this up, I'm not cleaning this up. And like, even with the US elections, right? And everyone's like, oh no, what's gonna happen now, now that we have this guy? I tell you, you should step up. Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama 2020. Michelle Obama. I was like, leave her alone! <laughs> leave her alone! She can't even wear a dress showing her arms without somebody going, ooh, the monkey. And then you want to go and put herself in the firing line. No, leave her alone. She is retired. She's enjoying her life with Obama on boats and on beaches. And she is not taking that fucking stress. She had taken that stress. She had taken that stress. And everyone was like, Oprah! And I was like, fair enough, Oprah. Yeah, fuck it. Fuck it, Oprah. Yeah, fine. Yeah, fine. But Barbara, Michelle, leave her alone. Like I said before, I do agree with... Thank you. Like I said before, I do, I do actually agree with women taking charge. I just think that you've got to be careful. There's self-preservation. Put your neck on the line. You've got to... You're not any good in charge if you're not looking after yourself. I decided to take charge. Uh, recently. Deeply regret it. Um, uh, so on Twitter, uh, there was loads of talk about Love Island a few weeks ago, and I decided to join in the chat, which was a mistake. Um, so I was just saying, look, hey guys, hey guys, hey guys, um, I don't really, I don't watch Love Island, because I don't, I don't. The reason why I don't watch Love Island is, I think, a very valid reason. I had an experience when I was 14 on a reality TV show before the term reality TV, I think, was really coined, I think. And I had a great time, I had a lovely time. Um, we went off to the Bornean jungle and we were, you know, I was about to say swinging around. <laughs> we really weren't, we are 14. They did put us up on harnesses actually quite high. <laughs> we're swinging around, we're swinging around. And I had a really lovely time and I made loads of friends and I was really well looked after and I came home all in one piece. And then when the show aired, I was barely fucking in it. And it was a real shock because I was like, oh, but I felt like a really good student. But also I felt like I was funny and I was all those things. And it just wasn't included. And there was this one segment that actually my IT teacher said was really upset about, which was they got us all to phone home. We got to phone home with our families after quite a few weeks without talking to our parents and loved ones. So it was this montage of clips of all the kids. We're all like 13 youngest, oldest 15, all calling home in tears, crying. Oh, my God, mom, I miss you. I miss you. Dad, I miss you. I miss you. And I wasn't shown. For whatever reason, I just wasn't shown. And I'd had a really, really emotional conversation with my family. From what I remember, no swearing. Although there may have been some swearing. It was CBBC, so maybe I couldn't show it. But I felt like I was properly erased, and so I said this. Oh, my God. Did the racists come out? They were like, what do you mean? It's got nothing to do with... What do racists do? They, well, you, they, you know, they come in all sorts of voices um <laughs> boy do they come different voices and everyone's like oh my god like oh my god you're trending on twitter oh my god this is a twitter storm it's not a twitter storm those are racist speaking isn't a twitter storm that's called life that's just fucking life for me like it's not a twitter storm but all my mates were like oh my god how are you gonna come back from this what are you gonna say and i really thought about it. i was like look i feel like what I was trying to say was hijacked. People are not respecting my experience. It's not a case of like wanting to talk about it, it's just outright rejecting it. What I was trying to get people to understand is that you might think that this person, this black woman on TV has been shown a, a fair amount. But what you have to understand is where has that come from? Like, are you just used to seeing 
the narratives of people of color on TV less than everybody else. And so that's why you think it's acceptable. Just take it from me. Just have a little listen to me and how I live my life like you do. That when it's edited out where you can't even say, I miss you to your family, but yet everyone else has shown that at 14. That's saying something. That's saying that that story isn't worth it. And anyway, so... I had a few friends who were like, we think that you should write a piece, write a piece, like, you know, retaliate, retaliate. And I thought about it. I did honestly think about it. But then a friend of mine sent me this really powerful piece about how it's important to speak out. Of course, it's important to take charge. It's important to say your piece and lead your narrative. But particularly as an artist, and I think like this is fitting because we are here in the BFI, we're part of the Guilty Feminist Book Club, book club, film club. We're part of the Guilty Feminist Film Club. Fucking hell. Um, I was sent this, uh, which is a few words by Toni Morrison, which I'm going to end with. Racism was always a con game that sucked all the strength of the victim. It's the red flag that is danced before the head of the ball. Its purpose is only to distract to keep the bull's mind away from his power, fuck that, her power, and her energy. Keep it focused on anything but her own business. Its hoped for consequence is to define black people as reaction to white presence. And I urge you to be careful, for there is a deadly prison, a prison that is erected when one spends one's life fighting phantoms, concentrating on myths, and explaining over and over to the conqueror your language your lifestyle, your history, your habits. And you don't have to do that anymore. You can go ahead and talk straight to me. Thank you very much. Uh, can you go wild for the wonderful Deborah Francis Wise? I want to have a go at directing a scene and I want it to be a beautiful, classic film scene. I think the best directors, they have their own vision. So the short film we saw from Jennifer earlier, she'd written and directed it. So I want to create this here with you. So uh, could I have a genre, please? A rom-com. I've heard rom-com, I've heard horror and I've heard sci-fi. Uh, just shout the one you want. One, two, three. Sci-fi! People want sci-fi. Okay. It's not my greatest genre. <laughs> But I feel I can make it work, OK? I'm not going to ask if this scene is going to be about a man or a woman. It's going to be from a woman's point of view. Not that men aren't important. I've just seen everything they've ever thought. So, <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I want something new. Do we have any actors in the house? Um, brilliant. Super. What's your name? Connie. Connie. OK, Connie. Would you be willing to come up on stage? Yes, of course. Brilliant. OK, Connie, could you come up? Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. There we are. And so could I have a title for the film, please? Oranges. Oranges. Okay. <laughs> Sci-fi called Oranges. Okay. All right. This is my vision. It's a hundred years into the future. Because of global warming, there's no citrus at all. <laughs> and in fact, we are at a point where the earth is in a very bad state in terms of food. I mean... The UK is long gone because of Brexit. We had, we had four years of food delivered by the army and then we ran out and there was no trade deals. But the earth as a whole is now having problems supporting any kind of food. There's some women who stocked up and they have come to this place in the Outer Hebrides and they've got a box of oranges and it's sort of something that they're guarding and it's sort of, they know they're going to run out. They know they're going to die. They're very young. They're very cute. That's Thanks. key. Um, <laughs> adorable but it's sort of become a metaphor for them one of them is breastfeeding and the other one is deeply in love with her they both sort of know but it's never really spoken about because survival has to be first right now could I please borrow see that jumper that looks like a baby yeah could I have that please okay super oh thank you, thank you. No, teamwork teamwork well done well done 
this is like a film set. Everyone's hands on deck, hands on deck. So you've taken the baby, so you are breastfeeding. Got it. What's your name's Connie? Connie, yes. Okay, I think I'm going to keep the names Connie and Susan, oh, right, just I mean, because... Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, cast, brilliant. Oh, you're, yeah, yeah. You've I didn't know, job, I was Susan. waiting. I was waiting for the phone to ring. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Dick Dr. <Dr>. Boo, my script. <laughs> you ring, got the part, ring, ring, got the part. You got the part. Ring, ring. Susie, it's your agent. You've got the part. <laughs> In oranges. <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> the fuck is this? Okay, all right. So I want just the feeling, because I'm going to describe what the scene looks like, A, because it's a podcast, and B, because, you know, film just isn't about people chatting, obviously. It's about how things look. So this is a sort of Scottish wilderness. So I want it to sort of be sort of, yeah, some people are just improvising, and I like what you're doing. They're, they're just, <laughs> some people are sort of doing this. There's sort of like a feel of the heather and the hills. Um, and then there's, yes, exactly yeah. that noise. Brilliant. Well done. Follow you. Follow you. What's your name? Anu. Anu. Anu's in charge of sound. So if Anu, can I get Anu a mic? So you're going to guide the sound. When Anu makes a sound, I want you to follow her. And then I might up, you know, sort of up or down. Okay, ready? Shh. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 yeah Rad. Okay. okay. Shh. We're in black and white. There's some heather and a light breeze. One lonely, very thin bird searching for food. Bird. One, one. Lonely, very thin bird. Close up on the bird. The bird lands on something that used to be food, but now is it? It dies in desperation. We pan around to a lock-up, it's a shed, mm-hmm. and we come up close to a keyhole, and we go through the keyhole, inside, two women the sit and shiver. <laughs> <laughs> the baby wails, Anu. Yeah? The baby wails. <laughs> Okay, so we see Susan's eyes, just Susan's eyes. We know that they're looking at the baby. They're looking at the baby. And we see the baby's eyes looking at Susan. And Susan's eyes looking at the baby. This is her family. It's all she has left. All her family have died in the famine. Connie looks at Susan. Susan looks at the baby. Connie looks at Susan. Susan looks at the baby. Got it, sorry. <laughs> There's a sort of triangle mm. of love and hope. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh. I looked up at Connie, sorry. Oh. Now, there's only three lines in this scene. Mm-hmm. And I don't know who says them. I'm just going to offer them up. Okay. Three lines. Sorry. Okay. One line is, have you checked the oranges? Mm-hmm. I don't know what order they're in. Mm-hmm. Have you checked the oranges? <clears throat> One line is, you know I love you and death won't change that. And one line is, they're here. Okay? okay. So the scene begins. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. So we're going to take it from the top. And you know who you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah baby. Yeah, got it. All right. Yeah. So bird. <laughs> Death of bird. <laughs> Pan through the lock. <laughs> and then somebody says one of the lines. You know I love you. Death. Won't change that. Have you checked the oranges? <laughs> then the sound of 200 hungry Scottish people <laughs> descending. They've heard about the oranges. <laughs> the oranges? They're here! Same. The well done. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, if I'm not given money to direct <laughs> oranges, million pounds. yeah, I think it's a good thing if I'm not oh. given money. Our guest today is an award winning director and writer who has also edited some of your favourite television comedy shows. Put your hands together and make enormous, guilty feminist welcoming noises for the wonderful Jennifer Sheridan! <laughs> Ah, ah. 
Hello. Hello. So, Jennifer, we saw your short film before. It was really, really good. And the audience at home can see it where? Oh, I didn't realise you were going to show that one, actually. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, really? Well, I can put it on the website. It's fine. I'll I thought that it. was one you oh, sent no, us, wasn't it? I sent you another one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one we got. Oh, God. I sent you two. Oh. One was 72 seconds, and I thought, that would be a winner. They'll love that, because it'll be over like that. That's like Oh, is it literally 72 minutes. seconds? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It's what? a horror comedy, by the way, guys. Do you know what? When I watched this, I did think... I can see how it's sort of horrific. I don't know that it's a comedy. <laughs> and I, it, you described it as a horror comedy. I thought she just spent, you know, like Black Mirror. I thought she yeah, just yeah, described yeah, it as yeah. a sort of genre. I Sorry. genuinely did wonder. But it's stunning. It's a Absolutely. beautiful film, and I'm Thank so you. glad we didn't want to see something 72 seconds. This is the Guilty Feminist no, Film no, Club. No, no, we wanted no, no, to see no. a proper film. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Which it was. And can the audience at home watch this film? I'll put it on the website, jenniferdirector.com. And yes, Great. that URL was available, which uh, says. A little bit about the state of play. (laughs) So, jenniferdirector.com, and they can go and see the film. What's the film called? The Super Recognizer. The Super Recognizer. Yeah. So, if you're listening at home, just to recap, it's a film that's in the genre of Black Mirror, which most of you will have seen. It's about a man who can recognize lots and lots of faces. Yeah, which is an actual, real, genuine thing that I don't think really comes across. I tried to sort of set it up. I was like, the Metropolitan Police set up their super recognition department in 2005, which is totally true. But afterwards, everyone's like, that was a good idea. I was like, no, but they're real. And I they're believed like, it. Oh, I oh, believed it. Is it like people who can see, like, recognise those people? Yeah. Wow. I know. I believed it. Did anyone, Who believed that there were really people? Yeah, just cheer because oh, it's a podcast. <laughs> Great, super. So, yeah, we all believed that. I'm a bit face blind. Um, That's a I, thing. I need to get diagnosed because I have got mild face blindness. That is a thing. Um, I haven't got face blindness. The way one of my friends, who I think is in tonight, she has face blindness and so does her mum. There she is, Fiona. And they sat next to each other at an airport for an hour and a half. <gasps> find each no, other. really? Yeah, true story. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got that. But I need to meet people six to eight times before I can recognise them. And I struggle with it. And people often also, they know me from the podcast or doing comedy or something like that. And I've met them once. So they think I'm going to know who they are. And I find it awful that I don't know. Yeah, I live with struggle is what Ah. I'm saying. We're your allies. Don't you worry about it. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Fuck it, hell. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I am oppressed, Susie. Don't I know, forget. I know, I know. I know, with my mild face blindness. <laughs> um, but anyway, the film is very, very beautifully directed oh, and I feel it really has an authorial flair. It's gorgeously put together. Your job is mostly editor, yes? Yeah, I've been editing for 11 years, yeah. Female editors are quite rare as well, aren't they? Yeah, especially in comedy, which is where I found myself. How much do you think the editor has a say over the look and feel of the film? Or the television show? I would say they don't have much influence over the look Mm -hmm. because it's what you get given. I would say they have some influence over the feel. They can have some influence over the feel, but it really depends on how much freedom the director gives you as an editor because at the end of the day, they trump you in terms of the decision-making, final decisions. I think when I think a film is stylish, I often think it's the editing, the the way it's been cut and I thought your film was very very stylish just all of the different points of view and where we were looking and it felt like we were there in it I could sort of tell that you were an editor as well as a director because it was very beautifully shot oh thank you why do you think it is apart from the patriarchy that (laughs) apart from that little thing (laughs) yeah apart from the entire power structure of the world why is it that there aren't more female editors and directors is it simply the power structure and that there's so much money at stake and we're not trusted I think it's a lot to do with that. But then I also think that it's to do with self-confidence, like you said before, is like when I started being an editor, I'd sort of turn up to edits and I'd sit down and like people would come in and they'd be like, oh, yeah, um, I'll have a coffee. And I'd be like, no, no, uh, I'm your editor. And they'd be like, oh, right, okay," And they'd sort of side eye me for like the first sort of day until they were like oh no she kind of knows what she's doing so I can relax now she hasn't done a bad edit Mm. but the first low budget feature I cut I had this producer sat behind me and I was trying some stuff out it was a mockumentary I was just trying some stuff out and um, he obviously didn't like it because at the end of the edit day him and the director came in without me to watch what I'd done but by that point I sort of the stuff that wasn't working, I'd redone it. And so when I came in in the morning, they were like, oh, we love it. We love what you've done with it. It's great. And I was like, well, how have you seen it? Because <laughs> oh. I didn't see it. And then it. they had to confess that they'd 
sneakily watched it because I hadn't trusted you. Yeah. But I think that's the root of a lot of our confidence problems. And I've written about this in the Guilty Feminist book, that the root of the word confidence is trust. So, yeah. you know, like if someone's a confidence man, they're undermining your trust or yeah. someone betrays the confidence. Sometimes we trust ourselves, but we don't have the tribal confidence. Yeah. So we don't have the trust of our peers. Yeah. If you feel like, yeah, I trust myself to do this, but then you get the sense that the room doesn't trust you. Yeah. Or like they're sort of looking at your work to check or they're sitting and looking over your shoulder and they're making that face. Mm it can erode your confidence. Yeah. And I yeah. think sometimes when people say, why aren't women more confident? They're not taking into account that tribal confidence is not projected onto us. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that's what's actually undermining us. That's just only one of the amazing points in the Guilty Feminist book that you can read about <laughs> if, you bought it, if you bought it in hardback. I mean, in a way, is your confidence worth £15? That's what I'm asking. Um, <laughs> Search your souls. Because <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't know, I've been working in TV for quite a few years and I've very rarely met female editors. I know that that is something that you've left behind now and you're focusing on directing. But how did you get into editing? Well, when I was at university, sort of pretending to be a director because I didn't really know what I was doing, I would edit my own title sequences and graphics and stuff. And then my lecturer was like, oh, you can do that stuff. I was like, yeah, yeah, I do that stuff. I taught myself at home off YouTube. And then he said, oh, I know someone who's looking for a job, you know, a graphic designer kind of thing. Worked for him. He also needed an editor. I was like, I can edit. See, I've almost had the opposite of what you're supposed to have as a guilty feminist in that I've just been so overconfident for most of my life. I've just said yes. Whenever someone said, oh, can you do that? I've said, yeah, yeah. And then I've Googled it. Uh, well that's actually it's a good uh, friend of mine said because when I started writing I got given a commission to write pilot and I had never written anything and my friend Abby said you've got to follow the green lights follow the green lights so if someone says do you want to do this you just go yeah just do it just say yeah you'll learn on the job it's fine yeah Yeah. it's true and there's nothing that that you can't learn off YouTube that is what posh white men are doing they are just saying yes yes to things and then they're working it out on the job yeah Yeah. how else do you learn though other than doing it so exactly it's the only way so you're now going into directing. What have you directed so far? I've directed seven short films. Woo-hoo! Yeah, Thanks. damn right. About one a year. <laughs> That's a really good short film, though. Like, if you watch that, you'd be like, yes, I'll trust that person to direct a feature. Yeah. I always find it upsetting that women who... You've got so much experience in editing, so you're already in the business, you already know what's going on, you've already made your living that way, and now you've directed seven short films. I'm sorry, I just don't... I know this is true... Men don't tend to direct seven short films. No, no, that is true. They don't. That film should have got you more by now. Are you directing TV? Well. 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 I've written a Sky comedy short, which Jen is directing. Yeah. Wow. It's very exciting. So you've written it, Jen's directing it. Yeah. And I, so I got given the opportunity a few... Uh, about a month ago and they said you know do you have any stories and I was very clear I gave they said oh, do you have any ideas for directors and my list was just women just women right yeah yeah I wasn't interested in any but it wasn't even a conversation that we had I just got asked by a producer he's really lovely Bertie go on I've just shouted you out he wanted me to do that and uh, <laughs> oh yeah he's good uh, and, the, well, and did, I just gave him it's not really a shout out if you don't say his last name though Bertie Peake oh fuck's sake uh, no he's a lovely bloke he's a lovely bloke but no I gave him the list and I didn't even say I want female directors I was like that's my list like right. go figure and Jen already had been suggested to me by quite a few people, including Ben Taylor, who I've worked with. Oh, that's who, good. Um, and you've actually edited a pilot that I did. I was in it for a second. Oh, yeah. Curiously edited out. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, listen, that's, that's not your fault. Don't you take that. Like I said, you know, don't it's you... all the director. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just do what we're told. Don't, don't, hopefully no, you won't be don't. edited out of your own comedy short that you've written. <laughs> oh, fuck it. <Impossible>. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's everything to play for. Now you're a director and you've directed seven shorts, which is basically like directing a feature. Wow. You're now directing a television show. What advice do you have for people listening to this podcast who would like to direct? What um, do you know that we should know? So Susie's okay. doing a course soon in directing. Which is I great. really want to direct. Yeah. And I wrote a feature that was made last year that's coming out soon, will be released soon. It's called Say My Name. But when I was on that set, I thought, I really want to direct. I loved working with Jay, and he is absolutely fantastic, and I want to work with Jay again. But I also would absolutely love to direct. Yeah. What can we learn from you, Jen? I'm actually directing my first feature next year. Yeah! Yeah. 
Yes, get Thank in. You. Thank you. Can Thank you talk you. about it at all? Yeah, it's written by Matt Stoko from Misfits and Jamestown. Oh, Jamestown. yes, yeah, I know Matt. Yeah. yeah, and it's a sort of horror rom-com, which I'm really excited about. Mm. But what I, my advice would be, because the thing is, becoming a director is hard. Even if you're a bloke, well done you, it's still really hard. And basically, you just have to take the knocks, take all the festival rejections on the chin. They feel like a punch to the heart, but you get over it, it's fine. And just keep going, just never give up. Because basically, if it's what you think about when you're going to bed and when you wake up in the morning, what else can you do? It's not like you can go, oh, do you know what? I'll pack this in, I'll work in an ice cream truck for the rest of my life, it'd be great. Because you won't be happy. You've got to just keep going and doing what you want to do. And that's what I've done. That's not the only other alternative, by the way. Other jobs are available. But uh, it's, yeah, I know exactly. Good. When you said ice cream, I was like... It's my backup. It's my backup. I know exactly what you mean. On set, that's what I want to know. On set, how do you take charge, share your vision, know that you've got the technicals right? What advice can you give us on set? Hire really good people mm-hmm. that are nice to work with. Mm-hmm. Any dickheads, sack them off as soon as you can. Although you can't usually do that, we're not paying them. But, you know, <laughs> you meet them first and you go, oh, are you a dickhead? And they go, oh, no, I'm not. You're like, you sure? And they're like, yeah, you okay, okay, fine. Right, you've got the job. <laughs> and then it's very collaborative. I like to work collaboratively. And I think because my background is in editing, I like different voices and I like to hear people's opinions. Even if the runner's like, oh, I don't know if you should shoot that way. I'll be like, know your place, shut your face. <laughs> But good point. Yeah, I might shoot like that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But like, yeah, just don't shoot people down. And But know what you want. Right. And have a vision. The time that you know you're in the right place is when someone comes to you with a crisis and they go, oh my God, we can't shoot like this because the window is coming that way and it's going to like, it's, it's all wrong. And you go, it's fine. We'll just shoot like that. It'll be fine. And you seem super cool about it. And inside you're going, ah, oh my God, oh my God, because you're like, that's not my house. I storyboarded it completely differently to this. But you just kind of, when you can roll with it, mm-hmm. it feels okay. amazing. So even if you're panicked on the inside, what the set want to see is a calm yeah. exterior. Yes. So you calm. just go, okay, well, what are our other options? That's what I would do. When you said, oh, it's fine, we'll shoot it like this. I thought to myself, what I would say is, cinematographer, yeah. what are our other options here? Yeah. Because this one's not available to us anymore the way we storyboarded it. You know what, that's actually a really good point in that you get the team that you trust. Once you have a team that you trust and that you like and you were decent people, then it's so easy to, like the best bit of advice I was given is don't hire people or surround yourself with people where you think you're the cleverest person in the room. You want to keep learning from other people. And if you do have a problem with the window, which I don't know what you're talking about, but once I've done my course, I'll I'll know exactly what you're talking about. Then you can go, right, okay, cool. So what else can we do? And you can take advice and it can be collaborative as opposed to you driving it. But I do believe the director steers the ship. Mm. And I think that the best way of doing that from experiencing so many different directors, is that calm. Like, there can be panic. You cannot be the director and panicking. Once you do that, you've lost everyone. Yeah, game over. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Shouty directors are just... Oh, they're the worst. I fucking hate them. I hate those guys. You know you are. Can you quickly tell us anything you would like us to see, watch... Susie, what's your project on Sky? Oh, so uh, the title at the moment is called Love the Sinner. It's and a beautiful script. By Thank you. A beautiful it script. By I Susan cried when I read it. I laughed cried. and cried. Oh. Yeah. Made a, yeah, that was it. She walked in for a little interview. She's like, and uh, I laughed and cried. I was like, give her the job, give her the job, give her the job, give her the job. <laughs> oh. and because that's the point. With all the comedy that I write, it's always got to say something. It's got to mean something. And you absolutely got that on the head. And just so fucking prepared and I was just at a point where I was so sick of mediocrity and people coming in and not knowing what they were doing and just thinking oh I could just wing this and you were just like no this is why I imagined for it and it just was brilliant you do your fucking homework like you just do that it makes me calm down it makes me give my script to you and go right I trust you I actually trust your judgment I don't know of course I'm not the smartest person in the room and it's just fantastic and I think it's going to be brilliant there it goes it is going to be brilliant the only thing I will say is I've just heard the director of Oranges is available now Uh, and you may want to reconsider because she is something else she is something else (laughs) I fucking heard (laughs) anything else you want to plug we need uh, to go to your website to see the rec- is it the recognizer? The super recognizer. The super it's recognizer. It's not the best title. I don't love the title, but that's actually what they're called. They're called super recognizers. Oh, I like it. actual. It's yeah. dumb. I, I wish I'd called it fancy snitching. 
Because I went to a screening the other day and this fancy amazing snitching. woman, she was like, oh, so that's just fancy snitching. I was like... And you were like, legend. Yes. <laughs> Why didn't I call it fancy snitching? Damn it. Change the name, put it back into all the festivals. Oh, I'm actually writing it as a web series. Are you? For a company in New York called First Lip Media. Brilliant. Wonderful. Will it be called Fancy Snitching then? Or will it be I'm called... hoping so. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> yeah Fancy Snitching. Okay, we're yeah. into that. Also, if you would like to buy my book, I haven't mentioned it tonight, but um, <laughs> it's called The Guilty Feminist. It's available in Waterstones and you can you know, get it online or in a shop. Susie, where can we follow you? I'm around. Susan underscore will come on Twitter if you fancy it. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know about me. It's true. You already follow Susie. Don't pretend that you don't. Okay, just a big round of applause and thank you to the BFI for having us. Woo! The wonderful Jennifer Sheridan. Woo! And my excellent co-pilot for this evening, Susan Wacoma. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co Susan Wacoma, and a very special guest, Jennifer Sheridan. The recording engineer was Grundy Lizimbra. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Chris and Amy at Phil McIntyre and everyone at the BFI, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you very much. That's our show. I've been Deborah Francis White. Good night. you didn't hear last night turned up at a comedy club and did a set and when he walked out to the stage the audience gave him a standing ovation and then they were saying oh the, you know sex allegations blah 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 and may martin quote tweeted that going they weren't allegations he admitted it how is that an allegation it's Ridiculous. a fact it's a factigation um, <laughs> maybe i could coin that factigation factigations against him yeah man <laughs> if, i don't think it's just ridiculous. 